power. Here's top fuel. A little gasoline being sprayed into the injector of Gene Snow to get that motor started. It was Snow who won on driving ability alone in round number one when he hole shot at Rocky Epperly. Snow, a veteran out of Fort Worth, Texas, has put his talents on the line as he comes up against Gary Ormsby. As we said earlier, Ormsby starting on the national event trail about the mid-season point here in 1983. Snow from Fort Worth, Texas, known as the Snowman. Gentleman Jane, and he truly is that. Gary Ormsby, who struggled amateur drag racing for a number of years, now has a very successful Toyota dealership in Northern California and can well afford to race. In front of him, the red shirt, a very talented crew chief. That is Lee Beard out of Colorado, now wrenching for Gary Ormsby. And Ormsby served notice back in August, winning the popular hot rodding championship at Martin, Michigan, that uh, he was a force to be reckoned with. Gene Snow on again, off again. He's either right at the top of the field or struggling at the back. They experiment a lot. Uh, Snow no, no longer has any sponsors. He has to please uh, just himself, and he has a good time doing it. Steve, it looks like they've got some trouble with Gary Ormsby's car, and it appears the tire has gone flat. The right rear slick has got a lot of wrinkles in it that shouldn't be there. And here from Shirley Maldowney's crew comes an air can to try to get it pumped up, but they're not going to be able to get it done in time. And Gene Snow waltzes through the second round and into the semifinals at a 587, 213 miles an hour. Gary Ormsby plunks it in reverse and backs it into the staging lanes with that right rear tire good and flat. And that's a tough break for Ormsby, but that's one of those things that you just can't predict. I mean, you can put an engine together and you know there's some problems maybe, but a tire going flat, hard to believe. Shirley Muldowney standing on the throttle as she comes out of the burnout area. Those huge slicks just spinning and smoking, getting them very hot. It was one year ago at the same racetrack that Shirley Muldowney annexed her third Winston World Championship title. Earlier today, Steve had a chance to talk with Shirley about her season this year. Yes, we lost it this year, and we lost it to a good car, somebody that really earned it. So we'll try to regroup and come back next year. Uh, Gary Beck did a wonderful thing for us. He really got top fuel out of a, a little bit of a rut. And what he did was set a pace that's going to be awfully hard for a lot of people to follow. We think we can catch up. And that's what we did, play catch up all year. But next year, it'll be a different year, hopefully, for us. Well, let's hope at the end of next year that this wing goes back on. Yeah, we'll just take it off the wall, put it back on the car. <laughs> the big number one, residing at least for this race on the wing of Shirley Muldowney, the premier woman driver in all of motorsports. Her crew chief, Ron Tobler, her son, John, and their crew helping to push the car back. Shannon Stewart, her competition, Stewart, an up-and-coming driver, his second year on the season out of Riverside, California, qualified well, defeated in an upset win, Connie Kalita in the first round. The burnouts are over, both cars approaching the starting line. It's Shirley Muldowney in the near lane, Shannon Stewart in the far lane. A lot of concentration needed on the Christmas tree and on the starting procedure for these cars because an advantage gained at the starting line is very difficult to overcome at the finish. A green light start for both drivers and Shirley Muldowney pulling ahead in the middle of the course and she wins it and Shannon Stewart ends up in the lane right behind her. Apparently unable to keep the car in his own lane, he crosses behind Shirley Muldowney but she was way ahead with a fine 5.65 second elapsed time, a speed of over 241 miles an hour, and in crossing over the lane, Shannon Stewart ran over the timing lights in the middle of the track. NHRA officials C.J. Hart and Jim Van Dyke replacing the lights in the center of the track, surely getting out of her car. Earlier, we had an opportunity to talk to Gary Beck about his strategy. If you had seen Shirley Muldowney's run just in prior to us, she's hazed the tires off the starting line. We're going to move over to the right about 18 inches and look for a little better spot. So actually, this is giving us a little better time to make sure we're going to make exactly the right move down there. And uh, we'll be all right. We do this every other weekend, you know, so it's not a big problem. Gary talked about the lane and the racing conditions on the track. Gary, do you ever think about the competition alongside of you? Well, we race against each competitor a little different, and uh, I have a game plan in my head here now how to, how to when the light goes green, that, that our car is as ready as it is to race against Richard Thorpe. And we do that a little different against each different competitor. But 
we're racing against a lot of very great competitors, and so we know we have to make good runs after good runs after good runs. And that's the attitude the racing team tries to take. Let's go to Steve Evans. Gary Beck's performance edge has nothing to do with the race car itself. There's at least a dozen of them here, the twin to this machine. The secret is in the fuel system. After hours and hours on a flow bench simulator, Gary has come up with this maze of lines and valves that will put two and a half gallons of nitromethane through this engine in five seconds. Now, they can't really just copy it, the competition, because they don't know how it works, and some of these lines and valves may be here just to keep them guessing, keep them confused. Now, all the horsepower in the world doesn't do you any good if it goes up in tire smoke. So part of Gary's secret is the clutch inside this explosion-proof bell housing. It allows the excess horsepower to go through the clutch in slippage instead of spinning the rear tires. We've removed the transmission so you can see this massive rear end, a bit of off-road technology here, a live axle rear end that has virtually eliminated the tire shake on this automobile. Now tires, again, part of Beck's secret. He doesn't take any pair. They will go through hundreds of tires to find just exactly the right size, the right width, and that coupled with some special width wheels contribute to this secret. The remainder of it is the man himself. Very few drivers would be capable of operating this car. There are so many bells and whistles and things to do on the way down the racetrack. Steve, a great look at the inner workings of this man's car. This is Gary Beck, the new Winston World Champion in Top Fuel Eliminator. And his opponent here in the second round, Richard Tharp, bask in the glory of the World Championship back in 1976 at the wheel of the Candies and Hughes car. Based out of Dallas, Texas, the Gilpatrick and Cannell team using the same chassis design as is Gary Beck. It's an Al Swindle car, but there is a different approach to the utilization of the fuel systems between these two cars. Well, if anybody's going to figure out how Gary Beck does it, it'll be that team. They are staged and ready. Richard Tarp in the four lane, Gary Beck in the near lane. We've got a race. Gary Beck breaks right on the starting line. Oh, good fortune for Richard Tarp as he did not have that good a run going. Richard Tharp at 593, 228 miles an hour, and Gary Beck beats himself mechanically. Very dejected, he sits in the car. This is the quickest top fuel dragster in the history of the sport. The crew and the officials coming to push it off the starting line. Obviously, something letting go in the drivetrain. As we watch again, Richard Tharp in the far lane, they leave almost identically, but then the broken part puts Gary Beck out of competition, and Richard Tharp with an easy run in round number two of the 16 car field. The day is over for Gary Beck, but the war has been won. He is the new Winston World Champion. And we get word from the starting line that Gary Beck broke a transmission. Beck climbing out of the cockpit is already. The next race is on the starting line. We saw Ray Stutz, a young fireman for Pomona, making his burnout. Beck with a helmet off. But it's a little different situation, don't you think, here, Dave? He's got that World Championship one, not quite as dejected as he might ordinarily be. If he had not had that, I'm sure he would have been much uh, more concerned about his going out of competition this early. Here is Ray Studs. We said he is a fireman in Laverne, California. He is racing Joe Amato from Old Forge, Pennsylvania, one of the hottest new drivers on the circuit. Won three events this year. What a contrast here. Both have state-of-the-art race cars, but Ray Stutz, this gentleman in the blue car, is a fireman who works three or four part-time jobs, saves every penny he can get his hands on to build this car, and has been performing very well, a 560 in round number one. He has had a little help kind of under the table from Larry Miner and Gary Beck. They really like this young guy. Joe Amato moving in, Ray Stutz, second round, top fuel competition, the Winston World Finals. Ray Stutz moves first, but up in smoke. Possibly too much clutch, maybe too much gear, not enough tire, whatever. It is Joe Amato. And Joe proves that he is in the thick of things with a 5.68 elapsed time at 239 miles an hour. And just overpowering the racetrack is Ray Stutz. The car leaves with the wheels in the air, and then the tires start to smoke. And that's all she wrote for Ray Stutz on this day. They'll get up on those wheelie bars and kind of unload, as you know, Dave, and uh, uh, transfer the weight to the front end, and the tires go up in smoke. Anytime Gary Beck is out with mechanical problems, you can bet it's going to be a guy like Joe Amato that'll step up and suddenly become a crowd favorite to maybe even win this whole race.